can be recorded. So perfect. Um, let me open this up. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hopping on and being on time. And we'll let folks trickle in. And um, we hope everyone got an opportunity to enjoy some rain yesterday in your part of the state. Um, if you didn't, hopefully rain's going to come to you soon. I know a couple of my plants are incredibly happy right now. I'm still looking for some a little bit more, um, more of that moisture. Um, if you want, our chat feature is disabled, but in Q&A, you are still welcome to go ahead and throw in uh, where you're joining us in from um, and kind of how maybe the weather is in your neck of the woods. We love to hear who we got with us today. Um, my name is Chloe Crumley. If I haven't had the opportunity to say hello to you before, um, thank you for joining one of our bird friendly Texan webinars. Uh, these are our webinars featured around different topics um, that we're hoping to engage supporters and members about ways to be a bird friendly Texan. Um, this one on birds and transmission is with a wonderful panel of specialists that we have today. I'm um, to talk about what it means to build a grid that birds need in Texas and people. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off uh, to Lisa Gonzalez, who's going to help moderate um, our conversation today. Um, and we'll have an opportunity at the end to answer questions from the audience. As you have questions, feel free to use them in that Q&A box that you see on the bottom. Um, and we'll go ahead and answer those either live um, or in the chat function for that Q&A. And so feel free again to throw on where you're joining us in from. Um, we love to hear that about who we have with us. And then otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Lisa Gonzalez. Thank you all much so much for being here. Excellent. Thank you, Chloe. Um, really appreciate uh, your coordination of this uh, webinar and just welcome to everyone that's joining us today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon to talk about birds and to talk about transmission and the uh, Texas Energy Grid. We have got some amazing speakers joining us today and we're gonna have a conversation with them about energy infrastructure, uh, the grid, uh, the transmission needs uh, for Texas and, and beyond, um, and also you know, where we're sitting today in Texas with regards to the policy framework uh, around these issues. So again, just thank you all for taking the time to join us today on this really important issue for, for Texas and for Audubon and for birds. So um, first, just a little bit, Lisa Gonzalez, I am the executive director for Audubon Texas. We're the state office of the National Audubon Society. Um, and joining me today, uh, we have three panelists that we're gonna have a conversation with. Um, the first is Beth Garza. Beth is a senior fellow with R Street. R Street is a nonpartisan think tank that's based out of DC. Beth works out of Austin. Um, she is um, on their in energy and environmental policy team. Um, prior to joining R Street, Beth served as a director of the Electric Reliability Council of Texas or ERCOT. Uh, their independent uh, market monitor from 2014 through 2019 after serving as deputy director uh, starting in 2008. So Beth has some amazing experience uh, working on energy issues uh, here in Texas. Um, also joining us, we have Doug Lewin uh, with Stoic Energy. Doug's the author of the Texas Energy and Power Newsletter. If you haven't signed up for that newsletter and you're interested in Texas energy issues, I highly recommend it. He's also the host of the Texas Power Podcast uh, with Renewable Energy World. Um, Doug is the founder of Stoic Energy, a consulting firm uh, that works on renewable energy issues here in Texas. I first met Doug um, back when he was the director of STEER, the South Central Partnership for Energy Efficiency as a resource, um, doing great work here in Texas. So we're just excited um, to have both Beth and Doug. They're just um, two of our state's top energy experts uh, speaking with us about these issues. Also joining us today, we have Gary Moody. Gary Moody is uh, also with the National Audubon Society. 
Uh, he joined Audubon back in 2014. Uh, he works out of Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, he works on the state and local on state and local climate strategy. And he is a member of our climate and renewable energy team. And Gary is going to be talking to us today about a new report that Audubon released this summer called uh, the Birds in Transmission Report, Building the Grid uh, that Birds Need. It's a national report, but of course there's a lot of great information uh, in there that we can bring down to the scale of the work uh, that we do here in Texas and the partners uh, that, that we at Audubon can engage with on these issues because um, Energy issues, of course, aren't just important for people, but for those of us working in the conservation space, we have a lot of intersections between building out the transmission infrastructure that we need for our communities, but also doing it in a way uh, that is responsible and protective of the habitat that birds need, um, because that, of course, is the core of our mission at Audubon. And, um, the reason that, that you all are engaging with us today because you care about birds. Um, so with that, I wanna thank Beth and Doug and Gary for joining us. We're gonna have a great conversation. Um, before we do, we are going to uh, go ahead and jump into some slides that Gary Moody is going to share with us, um, specifically speaking about the Birds and Transmission Report that's really gonna lay the groundwork for the conversation that we have in the latter part of uh, the time that we share together today. So with that, I will hand it over to Gary and we will go ahead and jump in. Thank you, Lisa, and hi, everyone. Uh, very excited to be with you all today to present on the Birds and Transmission Report and to participate in today's uh, discussion with everyone. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Gary Moody and I'm the National Audubon Society's Director for State and Local Climate Strategy. Um, also, full disclosure, based just next door here in Little Rock. Uh, so my wife is a Texan, so I almost have a voluntary uh, status uh, <laughs> or honorary status there. Um, as we jump into the report, um, there's a lot of material to share. Um, it'd be easy to spend our entire time together talking about it, um, but we're not. I'm gonna try to condense it to about 10 minutes. So if I'm speaking normally fast for an Arcans and you, you'll understand why, uh, I'm doing my best to give you like a, a quick high level overview of, of what's in the report. So why transmission? Uh, as many as you, of you are probably aware, uh, Audubon's Survival by Degrees report found that two thirds of North American birds are at risk of range loss and potential extinction under unchecked climate change. Uh, in fact, climate change represents the single greatest threat um, to birds. Yet, 76% of those threatened species would see less range loss and be better off overall if we can stabilize climate change at the 1.5 degrees Celsius target of the Paris Agreement. However, meeting those goals is gonna require the rapid decarbonization of our energy system, which re will require significant transmission investments. Next slide. When we say transmission, what we're talking about are the high voltage power lines that carry electricity over often long distances from where it's produced to where it's ultimately consumed. Think of it as the interstate highway for electrons. And much like our interstate highway system, it was built over nearly the last 100 years for a different set of technologies and a vastly different capacity expectation. Now, as we look to move towards a clean energy future, we find ourselves nearing a crisis point when it comes to the climate readiness of our grid. I know Texas knows this firsthand with some of their experiences during winter storm URI. The end result is we need rapid major investments in additional capacity and flexibility if we as a nation are going to reach our emission reduction goals in time to avoid the worst climate impacts for birds and people. Next slide, please. To illustrate that point, I um, wanted to share this graphic with you that shows transmission is the pinch point. There are currently more than 10,000 clean energy projects nationwide, about 2,000 gigawatts of power 
that are waiting in line an average of five years in what we call interconnection queues. And while they wait for the go-ahead to proceed with construction, capital doesn't like to wait. So most of these low-cost clean energy projects give up and ultimately never get built. Earlier this year, the Department of Energy conducted a national transmission needs study. Uh, and that's the data you see on this slide. They found a pressing need for additional electric transmission infrastructure across the country. This map helps put the scope of that problem in focus. The white dots on the map represent the entire existing transmission grid. Each dot is roughly a thousand gigawatt miles of transmission. It's taken us nearly a hundred years of transmission deployment to build the white dots. The yellow dots are what the Department of Energy study estimated we will need to build in the next 12 years to reach the U.S. goal of 95% clean electricity by 2035. As you see in Texas alone, there's a need to nearly triple transmission capacity. Considering that it currently takes an average of 10 to 15 years to plan, permit, and build a new transmission project, the task ahead of us is truly daunting. In fact, if the pace of transmission deployment remains unchanged, analysis shows that the emissions reduction potential created by the passage of last year's landmark IRA climate legislation falls by 80%. We have, we have a lot of transmission capacity to build, and we have to learn to do it faster than we've ever done it and learn to do it better at the same time. This challenge is what prompted Audubon to initiate this report. To protect birds and our communities from the dangers of global temperature increases, we need to invest in more clean energy generation and transmission to enable it, all while being more efficient and embracing new technologies. Next slide, please. As always at Audubon, our advocacy is rooted in science. This report focuses on the nexus of birds, climate, and transmission to elevate how we can work to build the grid that birds need. It's important to note that while transmission has emerged as a national priority for Audubon, this work is not brand new to us. In 1989, we helped found the Avian Powerline Interaction Committee, which we call APLIC for short, uh, and have worked collaboratively with our industry partners since then to establish and study bird-friendly best practices. And we engage directly with developers on multiple projects to improve siting and operations to benefit birds. Uh, as you see here from, a, uh, from this picture, it's a study at our Rose Sanctuary in Nebraska studying the effects of UV illumination on transmission lines. Next slide. This report, however, for the first time has taken a much broader approach. To help determine our priority areas for transmission engagement, our science team created a new integrated bird prioritization data set by combining all six full annual cycle prioritizations and layering on top of that the 17 U.S. Clim climate stronghold priority areas. Next slide. Then we evaluated how transmission lines coincide with these priority areas for birds today and under future climate change with the integrated bird prioritization. We identified these high priority areas as 50 kilometer hexagon cells in the top 25th percentile of priority rank for birds and in the top 25th percentile for total existing and planned transmission line density. The impacts of transmission line on birds fall largely into two buckets, collision risks and habitat risks, and the priority engagement areas differ for each type. Next slide, please. Of the existing and planned transmission lines, about a third fall within high priority areas for bird collisions. This map illustrates the resulting areas. For example, here in Texas, the results identify the areas that you can see here with the larger orange and red dots as being especially important for responsible transmission siting. These areas highlight locations where reactive measures can and should be implemented near existing transmission to help reduce collision risk for birds and where proactive siting improvements and bird-friendly design can be implemented for new transmission lines. Next slide. Habitat is the second major bucket. Of the planned and potential transmission lines that could lead to habitat degradation or disturbance, about 27% fall within high priority areas for birds. However, most of these priority areas 
already occur with an existing uh, rights of way. So those are, are the symbols there that don't have the bold outlines. So that indicates that many of these areas can support projects that will not lead to additional habitat degradation in, in new habitats, although some disturbances may occur temporarily. Areas of highest potential for bird exposure to habitat disruption from transmission are primed for proactive measures, such as co-locating co rights of way and proper route planning to avoid high use foraging areas for high risk species. As you can see, transmission related habitat concerns are relatively low in Texas, with only a couple of areas outside of existing rights of way expected for development. Next slide, please. The report also found that there's a lot we can do to make transmission safer for birds. First, from our mapping, we know where to engage by focusing on the high priority areas where we can support transmission that is sited and operated properly to effectively avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts on birds. The scientific knowledge base on bird-friendly solutions around transmission is well-established and pretty robust, with many potential options that can be implemented to reduce risks to birds. Bird-friendly solutions reduce risks largely fall into one of two categories, proactive and reactive. Proactive solutions are implemented to avoid as many negative impacts as possible. Uh, and the reactive ones are done after construction um, to minimize any lingering in impacts. This graphic illustrates just a few of the solutions evaluated in the report. Uh, and together, these solutions can ensure transmission projects represent a net positive outcome for birds and communities. Next slide. That leads us to policy, my area. Uh, building on the scientific findings, the report also lays out seven priority policy objectives that will guide our transmission advocacy moving forward. As we continue our work directly with transmission developers and public decision makers in support of policies that allow for faster deployment of bird-friendly transmission. Again, here, I would encourage you to check out the full report, which we'll share in the chat later, uh, as I'll only be able to scratch the surface of these topics today. Next slide, please. So our seven policy priorities. First, we wanna maximize the effectiveness of the existing grid. The most bird-friendly way to quickly increase available transmission is to make sure we're squeezing the most juice out of what we already have. This includes wide-scale deployment of a suite of solutions called Grid Enhancing Technologies, or GATs, and maximizing non-wire solutions like microgrids, energy storage, and other distributed resources when available. There's evidence that taken together, these efforts could accomplish nearly half of the new transmission capacity we need by 2035. Audubon will also work to maximize the use of existing rights of way. To the greatest extent possible, new transmission should be planned and sited in areas with co-locating opportunities to maximize already disturbed land, um, including existing transmission, rail, highway, and pipeline rights of way, as that will minimize new habitat disruption and help speed deployment. We also need to improve transmission planning processes. It's very hard to get a good result from a broken process, and the current state of our transmission process is broken. Therefore, Audubon supports creating more robust transmission planning processes that employ at least a 20-year planning time horizon, use multi-scenario analysis, incorporate early and meaningful stakeholder input, utilize public funding to support participation from impacted communities, and appropriately balance conservation and community impacts with the need to rapidly increase our transmission capacity. We will also need to see a stronger transmission role from FERC, or the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. FERC can be invaluable in setting national standards for transmission planning, siting, and permitting, and serving as an arbiter when states and regions cannot agree. Over the last year, Audubon's engaged in several active FERC proceedings on transmission, and we plan to continue to do so. FERC's continued push for improved transmission planning requirements is critical to meet the scale and time constraints required to reach our emission reduction goals, and to create the safer, more resilient grid a changing climate demands. FERC isn't the only game in DC, as you know, we also need to secure other federal transmission policy reforms. 
Audubon will engage with the Department of Energy, Department of Interior, and Congress to advance policies that facilitate faster transmission deployment by leveraging federal investment, streamlining rules for federal siting, and encouraging private capital to invest in transmission. A lot of specific opportunities of interest are included in the full report. We will also need to prepare states for more transmission deployment. States play a critical role in approving and permitting transmission projects, yet very few have the resources required to keep up with the current pace of transmission deployment in a timely manner, much less the more than double paced rate of deployment required to meet our goals. While all states are unique, certainly additional states would be well served to create dedicated state transmission authorities, and all would benefit from the full utilization of recently passed federal funding available through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And finally, of course, we will advocate for bird-friendly transmission design and operations. Building on the science and our direct work with transmission developers, we will continue to push for voluntary adoption of siting and management best practices, and Audubon will actively look for ways to integrate both requirements and incentives for these practices into transmission policies where and when we are able. Next slide, please. In closing, a massive and fast transmission capacity build out is critical to our ability to meet the challenges we all face. And as Audubon, we have a unique voice to add to the conversation. We can powerfully speak as advocates for birds and communities, experts in science and mitigation and pragmatic problem solvers, able to find ways to improve outcomes for birds and people as we build out the necessary renewable infrastructure. I know I threw a a lot at you in a short period of time, but I appreciate you for sticking with me. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Gary. Really appreciate that overview of the report and everyone, hopefully you saw in the chat, the link that was shared so that you can um, download the report and dig into more of the detail. Uh, that Gary shared with us. And um, I think you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of information in there. Um, about the, the national issue that transmission is, um, but then there's a tremendous amount of uh, information that we can also bring down into the work uh, that we do in Texas. So thank you so much, Gary. Really appreciate it. So Gary's going to stay with us. And now we're going to, I think, pull down the presentation and bring up our other panelists. And we're going to dive into the conversation. All right, there is everyone. Um, we've got uh, Beth Garza and Doug Lewin, uh, who have joined us as well. Um, for those of you um, in the audience, um, I see some questions coming into the chat. Uh, please keep those coming. And um, at the end, we'll have a little bit of time to, to field some of those questions. So, okay, Doug and Beth and Gary for this conversation, Gary did a great job of laying the groundwork for us on kind of the, the problem that faces us around building out transmission across the US and, and in Texas. And um, before we really dive into that, I wanna just take a little step back and maybe even just kind of cover some of the basics. And um, Doug, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so those of us who are here in Texas this summer, um, we know it, it, I, I almost said it's a unique summer, but it's really not because we've kind of been here before with some of these extreme temperatures. This feels a lot like 2011. We're not quite there yet in terms of that drought, but you know, all across the state, we've seen extreme summer temperatures. Back in two, uh, thousand, or, uh, 2021, we were at the other end of the extreme in February with winter storm Uri and those extreme cold temperatures. So we've got, you know, we're managing between extremes is what I always say now. And when we look to our, uh, folks like our state climatologist and researchers like Catherine Hayhoe up at Texas Tech, I mean, what we're starting to see, we think is the start of a new normal. Um, in terms of what yeah. climate change may be bringing for the just the environment in which we live in, in our community. So 
just with that knowledge, Doug, could you maybe kick us off by just talking about the role that renewable energy plays in making up our state's energy mix in terms of meeting demand and like what that looks like now and potentially um, what the future role could be for renewables in the state? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for having me as part of this. And, and thanks, Gary, for the great presentation on the report. Um, I feel, feel a lot smarter after listening to that. I learned a lot. So, so thank you. And thanks to Audubon for all the great work you do. So um, look, renewables are going to be the, the backbone of um, efforts to decarbonize. Um, if you look at the whole spectrum of, of, of decarbonization, um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to it. Usually the, the biggest three, when, when you add them up on sort of, you know, a gross tonnage of emissions, you're talking about um, the, the power grid, you're talking, or power grids, right? It's not the power grid, but power grids around the world, uh, transportation and, and industrial. What we're looking at in transportation and industrial is a lot of electrification, right? We're going to need to electrify a lot of industrial heat. And we're seeing great, like there was an article I just read just the other day, I believe it was in Canary Media, which is a great one to, to check out and, and has a bird name of all things. I didn't even realize that before I said it, so that's great. Um, but no, they're, they're at the new uh, um, uh, media outlet that's really focused on covering climate and clean energy. And they had an article about how steel is uh, moving to electrified heat at a much faster rate than anybody expected, even as recently as a few years ago. Transportation, of course, the same, right? Electric vehicles, um, not just light duty vehicles, but we're going to see, you know, buses are already well on the way to being electrified, um, delivery vans, and eventually we'll see, we'll see trucks as well um, get there. So you've got to have the, the, the grid, you've got to have that decarbonized grid. Otherwise, if you're electrifying industrial and transportation, you could be electrifying it with, with, with fossil fuels and, and you're not getting nearly the benefit you would, you would otherwise. So um, luckily uh, here in Texas, Texas is very much uh, a leader on, on renewables, mostly driven by markets and economics and, and technology and the natural resource mix, just the, the, the abundance of wind and, and sun we have here. Um, we can dive into this more as we go, and I don't want to go on too long with this answer, but let me just say I, I started working on this stuff 15, 20 years ago. If you just told me then that we would have – uh, where are we about 55 to 60, something like that gigawatts of wind and solar. And so I think we're about 55, probably getting to 60 by the end of the year. I would have said, there's no way that's, that, that's, that's a wonderful dream. That's a wonderful aspiration, but that's not practical or pragmatic or realistic. There's no way we could be quite that high by then um, by 2023. And yet here we are. Um, so it's really a phenomenal story, um, and what what you know as the UT phrase goes, right? What happens, you know, what starts here changes the world. Like it really is kind of true, especially on energy. Um, Texas is that energy leader that a lot of other folks work to. So we're a little bit of I like to describe Texas as a postcard from the future. There's a lot of challenges associated with all these renewables, and one of those is transmission. I'm really glad Audubon's focused on this. We need more transmission. There is more being built, but it's not being built fast enough. We need to do a lot of things Gary talked about, reconductoring and uh, grid enhancing technologies and all that, you know, increasing the current right of way. Um, so there's a, I'll, I'll end with, with, I'll end this part of it with this, just saying there's been tremendous progress and it should, it should fuel a lot of hope and, and, and optimism because it really has moved at just a remarkably fast pace and there's a lot more work to be done and, and Audubon can play a huge role in that. So thrilled you guys are involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doug. You know, to, to kind of build on that um, and just thinking about like the policy conversations that we have in Texas and Doug, I'm going to stick with you just for another um, couple of minutes. You know, the words that we hear kind of bandied about are like grid reliability, grid resilience, but those two terms aren't interchangeable, are they? They mean different things. And there's some debate in the state about how renewables play into um, either additional or depending on who you talk to, lack of grid reliability or grid resilience. Can you speak to that a little bit also, just the role that renewables play in, in those two topics? 
Yeah. So, um, and, and I don't know if you plan to ask the same question to Beth. I'd love to hear her answer on the reliability resiliency thing too. If you don't get to it today, I'll call Beth later and ask her. Cause I, there, look, there's, there's literally a, uh, a couple different rulemakings going on at the PUC right now about this. They're redefining what reliability means because it used to just be the number of events. Was it one in 10 years? And now they're trying to take in, you can have one event in 10 years, but if it's URI, that's a terrible failure, right? So they're trying to take in, the, the, the not only the frequency, but the, the magnitude and the duration of the outages. And similarly on resiliency, there was a workshop just last week where the utilities had some legislation where they're going to be submitting plans on resiliency. And usually the difference is reliability typically is defined as you have enough resources, enough supply to kind of meet the demand. And resiliency is kind of more as, as, as this is not now I'm not going by any sort of definition you'd ever seen in rulemaking, but 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 to speak colloquially, we're we're, we're just talking here. Um, right. It's it's a little bit like, um, you know, that that famous Mike Tyson quote strategy is having to get what you have to get punched in the mouth. Um, resiliency is kind of when you take that punch. Are you able to, to get back up? So hurricanes and wildfires and droughts and heat waves. Um, these things just wreak havoc on grids and how resilient are they to those? Clearly, if you draw the circles, there's a lot of overlap between reliability and resilience, but they're not exactly um, the same. So, um, and 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 then you asked what what was sort of like how do renewables fit with that? So, yeah. every resource contributes to reliability. They contribute differently. Every resource has strengths and weaknesses. Um, we saw that during URI when gas, which is often thought of, um, particularly by policymakers in Texas, is like the most reliable thing, really had terrible problems during URI that really led to most of the problems. That isn't to say that there aren't weaknesses with, with wind and sun. They're well known. You know, newsflash, it's like I feel like it's like the most cliche thing in the world, but I'll go ahead and say it. Yes, the wind doesn't always blow. Yes, the, the sun goes down. So so obviously there every source has its strengths and weaknesses. Every source contributes to reliability. And we've really seen that this summer. Um, it's been an extraordinary summer for both wind and solar, particularly for solar, as we've seen day after day after day, way above what any you know um, demand reached at any year previously. And it's we're getting numb to it because just every single day in the you know 83 84 85 gigawatt range which again is kind of a number that would have been unthinkable even a few years ago and yet here we are and solar is really um, playing a standout role in helping us meet that uh, excessively high demand thanks doug i'm i'm <laughs> gonna take you up on your suggestion and maybe ask beth to to chime in with her thoughts on that same topic. I think it's a great opportunity while we've got you both on this webinar. Well, I, I, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the tee up. And, and um, as always, I'm going to follow on a one of the comments that Doug said. He tried to talk, he tried to describe the the, uh, you know, the amount of wind and solar capacity that we've we've have installed in, in Texas. And electricity capacity is kind of this esoteric thing that those in us in the industry know about. But for, for general people, the most important takeaway I can suggest is that 30% of total electricity requirements in ERCOT have been met by renewable energy, 30%. And that's that's up from fractions of 1% 20 years ago. That's where we are today. And we have the potential to go even further. And, and what has, you know, and we sit in the middle of a big old oil and gas state with lots of oil and gas interests who like their oil and gas, but, and what has, what has given way, what has, has shrunk in that interim, it's coal, it's the use of coal that has rapidly diminished. And, you know, what we used to bring some, you know, some stuff out of the ground that we would call coal or lignite and, and throw into power plants. But most of the coal that was put into utility power plants here in Texas came from Wyoming. So, you know, this concept that somehow we're, you know, we're sacrificing this great, you know, Texas resource by investing in renewables is, uh, from my perspective, a false false narrative uh, so far. So let me just get that off my chest. Your question of uh, resiliency versus reliability. Um, I think Doug teed that up very well. I think your question teed it up very well. You know, in the old days, we would, you know, 
electric system reliability from a resource perspective was really easy. We tried to figure out, well, what's the maximum of demand that our customers will require? And we'll just make sure we build a bunch of big power plants to exceed that demand. That It was pretty simple. Um, and all the entities were regulated and they got regulated rates of return for all of those power plants they were building. And so, you know, there's this drive to build more. As we've shifted to a competitive world and um, and power plant owners don't in Texas or in ERCOT specifically, don't get a regulated rate of return, right? They get paid when they provide value. And, and, and there's this hesitancy in this dance of, well, what is the, you know, how do I get capital to invest in new dispatchable capacity? I hear, you know, I hear our regulators and politicians talking about that as their number one priority. That may be their number one priority, but at, we don't, I'm not convinced that that's the only answer that we have to ensure a, a reliable uh, grid for Texans. And as, as things have gotten more complicated, as uh, we're dealing with more variable renewable resources, right? There's the, the difference between a fossil fuel power plant with a switch you turn on and off, and more likely than not, when you push the switch, it does operate, but it also does break too. <laughs> it breaks, you know, it's totally. We shift that risk away from um, the forecasting risk and the uncertainty of, well, how much is the wind actually going to blow today or this hour or six hours from now. And, and I, I continue to be hopefully not naively optimistic, but optimistic about the fact that as we, as we have more, we spend more time analyzing and understanding how those variations are, how they tie with the weather that then is driving customers' demands for electricity and how all of that fits together. Um, it's, I think it's a fun and interesting and challenging problem. I don't think it's impossible to deal with. The resiliency part, you know, my jaded answer that um, I, you'll, you'll get me, I, I'm going to say here for everybody, my jaded answer is, is resiliency is a concept that the regulated uh, transmission companies have come up with so that they can get paid to do more things that get them regulated rates of return. Um, that said, I don't want to diminish the very real impacts of, of people not having electricity and therefore not having water service and not having the, you know, what we consider the basics of life. So, you know, somewhere between my far snarky end and, and the, um, you know, and as much as all of these transmission utilities are going to want to try to get, you know, rate-based, um, somewhere there's the right answer in terms of how much should we be investing in resiliency and the and the ability to recover from, uh, as Doug described, the punch in the face? So, right. right. Well, Beth, you know that percentage that you threw out that renewables basically make up thirty percent of um, supply. I mean, part of the reason that renewables do make up that percentage and that Texas is the wind energy capital of the country, is it fair to say that part of the reason is for that is because at one point in time, um, Texas made a big investment in transmission capacity to move electrons from the western part of the state where the wind is over to the eastern part of the state where the people are? Yeah, I, I, I certainly. The um... The other the other thing that comes to mind is um, is a, a map that's been produced by one of the national labs that kind of overlays you know great solar wind resources versus with great wind resources and those two things overlap significantly across most of the state of Texas and so we're at this tremendous um, overlap of of those. Uh, you know, you can go west into New Mexico and Phoenix or Arizona and get more, you know, maybe more and better solar, but there's not the wind that you see that results here from Texas being kind of in the middle of the country, this big wind, uh, wind valley, if you will. Um, we have the, in Texas, we have the benefit of both of those. Um, we also had the benefit of a competitive generation uh, market that was created over 20 years ago, where you know, anybody with a billion dollars could come and if they could find some land and sign an interconnection agreement, they could, you know, they could build a power plant and potentially and sell its offtake and and um, and earn revenue from that. That 
And because we have such a good wind and solar resource, that's what attracts the, the developers to this area. That then was aided, uh, what, 10, 15 years ago by the investment in a significant and very specific investment in transmission. And um, I, for one, who's been a resident in Texas for a very long time and seen that arc from we like wind, here are the actions that we're taking, to what I hear our current, certainly politicians talking about, it, you know, it's just really a, a reversal. Um, it's not just a, 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 a step back from that investment. It's just a, it's a complete uh, about face, which um, it, as somebody who's in policy and trying to think about these long-term trends is a, is a frustrating situation to be in. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to, to take that line just a, a little bit further, when we think about like being in this moment now, again, with the need um, to invest in transmission, then to continue to increase the capacity to get renewables onto the grid, um, if we've had these investments in the past and we're here now in this market-based um, grid and this market-based mm -hmm. system, how do you think we best do this in Texas while also ensuring that costs are controlled uh, for consumers, for Texans? Right. And there's certain, and I, so, so now I'm going to sort of put my, uh, my transmission booster hat on because I think we do a lot of things related to transmission really well in Texas. And, and part of that is because, it, you know, frankly, we're, we're a big old state, state and we have big old swaths of open land. So, you know, sort of finding places to, you know, to get transmission lines would seem to be an easier problem than in, in, in many more constrained areas of the country. Um, and so even without something that's organized and focused as the uh, competitive renewable energy zones, the CREZ transmission projects we talk about, and really what that was intended to do is, oh, let's try to build transmission out ahead of where the developers are. And, and in the end, we really weren't because the developers, the generation developers will always be faster than the, than the transmission uh, approval and construction process. And that's, uh, that's just the, the nature of those two, those two paths. Um, so that we still see, we still see certainly lots of solar development spread across the region. Um, and the, you know, the advantages of solar are that it can be as big or as little as you want and therefore have the capability of, of sort of sizing to the, the, the getaway capacity that exists at various sites. I also want to touch on a couple of the transmission choices and, and, we, and Gary mentioned them in his, in his overview of the report, the various you know, technologies that how do we get the most out of our existing stuff? And, and I want to highlight a couple of things that Texas already does on a regular basis, because, you know, if I criticize on the one hand, I want to, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. Things like, you know, how do we maximize existing right of way? It has, if it's not standard practice, it certainly is become the norm that when a transmission line comes to, to the uh, Public Utility Commission for certification, more often than not, whether it's justified or not at that time, the towers will be built to support two circuits. So even if the justification is we can only justify one line needed between this point and that point, we're going to go ahead and design structures and install towers that will support two lines so that it because the incremental cost of that is very, very small when you weigh that against the the the, it, the cost of not doing it and potentially having to come back and replace structures to add a circuit. So that's something that I, I just sort of take for granted here in Texas. And when I talk to people in the rest of the country, that, that is not taken for granted, let me say it that way. So that's, that's one good thing. In terms of technology, things like um, um, dynamic ratings, you know, the, how much how much energy can you get across the transmission line is very much dependent on two things, temperature and wind speed across that line. And I, the last number I've looked, and I haven't looked recently, but the last number I knew is something like 80% of transmission lines in ERCOT are at least 
temperature rated. Their ratings will vary with temperature. Um, and it can be as simple as there's just a, you know, there's just a table that says how that rating will change as the temperature changes. There are also many lines, and I don't have a number on that, that are specifically rated based on the real life um, uh, conditions that line is operating under. All of that is, that's in my mind, kind of 20 year old technology, because we were trying to do that 20 years ago with the first big wave of wind, uh, wind generation and it being built in areas where there wasn't any transmission and how could, what are the things that we could do to try to get as much as we can out of that. So, I, you know, again, though, as I think about transmission, it, from an ERCOT perspective, I don't, I almost don't even think about that. It's like, oh well, yeah, of course we've got that. You know, we need to go on to the next things. Um, and certainly as I, I think about the other uh, other parts of the country, they're, they're not there yet. Many parts of the country aren't even there yet. So I, I wanna give those two shout outs um, for what we have done from a transmission perspective here in, here in Texas. Thank you, Beth. I, I think that's a really good tee up to circle back to Gary and the transmission report. So as we're, you know, we've made the case in this conversation for the role that renewables play in the energy mix for Texas and the need to expand transmission capacity in Texas. Um, and, you know, Beth, you just kind of circled back to, I think some elements of the report talking about maximizing existing rights of way existing technologies. Gary, can you maybe kind of bring us back to that tension that we have between, you know, the need to build out transmission infrastructure and um, the conservation community and the protections that we want to, of course, put in place for birds. Can you maybe kind of um, dive into some of the details um, in the report of how we can build out this transmission infrastructure while at the same time reducing impacts for birds. I think Beth just keyed in on a, a important one, which is maximizing existing infrastructure. But we know that there's probably also gonna need to be new infrastructure. You highlighted, I think, a couple of areas in the state where that may be the need. Certainly, um, and certainly like, I wanna put the caveat out there at the front end. Both Beth and Doug know Texas and you, Lisa, as well, way better than I ever will, right? Um, but they're both exactly right that they've done a lot of things very, very well. I mean, there's a reason there's more renewable energy on the ground in Texas than any other state. Um, Texas is also a growing state with big houses and hot summers and use a lot of power per capita, right? You got a lot of people and they all use a lot of power. Uh, and so in some instances, it's like, you know, much like a lot of things in Texas, you you need to be in a position of perpetual building just to keep up with the increased demand, right? As more and more people adopt electric vehicles, more and more people, um, you know, turn to more electric appliances and uh, we start to electrify other segments of the economy, um, that demand is only gonna grow even faster. Um, so as we do that, the key is, can we do it faster and do it in a more bird friendly way? And I think we can. I think that's what we went to uh, great pains to illustrate in the report, right? That there's some uh, uh, process streamlining that can happen. There, We've now identified a whole suite of best practices, such as, um, you know, we now know that line markings can reduce collisions by up to 90%, right? And so if we can identify the places that are of uh, the highest risk of collision impact, it's a very economical solution to include line markers on those lines, right? Um, and if it's species that are that move nocturnally, we now know that that uh, that UV illumination is a great you know nighttime solution uh, to make those lines visible at night without causing light pollution. I know y'all do a lights out Texas program, right? That's why we use UV instead of just uh, you know your normal, uh, light spectrum there. So we don't want to distract the migrating birds, but we want to let the ones, you know, moving around in the vicinity of power lines know that they're there. Uh, so there's a lot of solutions like that. And it's on us to re reach out to the developer community and make sure they're aware of those um, and make sure that, um, you know, that we're making the case for implementation. 
Um, cause what I would like to see is us being a voice for responsible transmission build out, right. Acknowledging like not building this infrastructure is not really a realistic option, right? Yes. We want to maximize all the small stuff we can do. And we want to maximize everything we can do with grid enhancing technologies and reconductoring and all of those things that keep us from having to build new rights of way, but we cannot pretend like we're not going to need to build some new rights of way, right? And having that sort of basis of reality, right? That 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 we are going to need some new infrastructure rollout in some new areas, um, then puts us in a productive mode of conversation where we say, well, how do we do it best, right? Um, and I would rather have those conversations on the front end so that. Um, we're speeding the process, not slowing it, because uh, that's another critical component, right? Um, so that's, that's I think, what the report was designed to do. And, and I can at least report early on that's how it's being embraced by the developer community, um, is they're seeing that they have a partner in Audubon and helping them do this better. Thanks, Gary. And um, I appreciate the plug for Lights Out Texas. <laughs> Chloe, but before we jump into the Q&A, can I just ask um, maybe Doug and Beth to just kind of take us out on just the policy issue? We just had a very active legislative session on energy issues, and I was just I'm wondering if I can just maybe get like a couple of like closing thoughts from you before we jump into Q&A on where you think we stand um, in, with with policy in the state and like what are some of the things we should be looking out for in, in ways that um, you know we might get engaged on some of these issues moving forward. Beth, do you want to go first? Should I? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first because I, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind of interest for this group um, is going to be the change to the process for certifying transmission lines has been legislative down to be shorter. It used to be a year and now it's six months. And so, you know, as Gary just said, trying to get in on the early, you know, in the early stage, you, you've, as an organization, as a, you know, as a community that has, a, a, you know, specific insight and provide input into that, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just stating that you'll need to be more nimble and aware and move quickly to be able to be part of that shorter process. So that's, I think that's probably the best thing for this group, um, you know, trying to cram all of the things that the legislature did and didn't do um, this session in three minutes is not going to be a productive conversation. So I'll just I'll just stop talking there. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. I'll, I'll just I'll just add briefly. Um, so uh, and I, and I'll I'll move outside of transmission here. Well, well, first of all, let me say. So and and Gary, I'm sure you're you're tracking this, but it might be good for for members that are really interested to to track this. There are two different proposals to connect ERCOT to other grids. So you know, it's often said we have no connections; we're an island. That's not quite true. We have a, about 1.2 gigawatts of connections right now, um, and again, 85,000 megawatt or or 85 gigawatt peak. So 1.2 is not that much, right? It's a percent and a half or two. But it's not nothing, and there's a two gigawatt uh, line proposed to go from West Texas into somewhere around like Mississippi, Alabama, uh, take renewables out most of the year and export them. But if there's a reliability event, turn it around the other way. There's also a proposal to build one um, into the Western interconnect, a little smaller. I think it's like a gigawatt and a half. Um, so that's a big issue people talk about a lot for reliability. But since we're talking about transmission, I would encourage folks to keep track of that, not necessarily a legislative issue. I'll mention one other thing that is a little outside of your topic, but I think it's just super important to mention. Yes, we need more transmission. Gary's a thousand percent right. And and sometimes it's presented as a which one should we do distributed energy or should we do, you know, renewables and transmission? We need to do both. We need to do both. And so um, that is another thing that I, I, I am hopeful the PUC will pick up on and do more of. They're doing some, like Beth said, we should give credit. There's a there's a pilot around distributed energy resources. Somebody asked in the chat about solar, you know, solar and particularly distributed storage have huge reliability benefit, cost benefits. We also need more energy efficiency. And what I like to talk about energy optimization, it's we're really moving towards a world where, yes, energy efficiency is important. We got to get rid of the really inefficient heat 
that we're using that's causing us a lot of problems in the winter time. There's also, though, going to be a lot of hours during the day where we just need to use more. Because <laughs> this is like, it hurts my head sometimes, but like, there's so much wind and solar. So think of the electric vehicles, charging them when wind and, and solar is abundant, and then not charging them when they're not so abundant. So the policies and frameworks to put that in place, the legislature didn't do that much on it, a little bit around the edges, but we really need leadership out of the Public Utility Commission, which as Beth knows for various times in the history of Texas has been a, a fantastic leader on this stuff. I could point to examples from Pat Wood and Becky Klein and, and um, I, I could go on, but there, there's, there's been many leaders at the PUC that have done that. We need a new era of that leadership. So I would encourage folks to watch for that too, because the more of the demand side you do, the more you can integrate those renewables. And I just want to be perfectly crystal clear that nobody mishears me. That doesn't, miss, that doesn't mean that we don't need more transmission. We do. It's a both and. We're going to have to do a lot of things right to deal with, to deal with uh, climate change and to have a reliable grid and, and an affordable grid. Yep. Thank you both. That was a fantastic conversation. I and and Gary, um, I just really appreciate the knowledge and information that you distilled in that really quick, you know, twenty to thirty minute conversation. Uh, Chloe, would you like to tee up a question or two before we mm -hmm. wrap up? Yeah, I would. Yeah, it was. Thank you all so much. It was really fun and informative. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience that I want to give in. Um, some folks just want to say thank you. you know, we have um, Susan from um, Benbrook, Texas. This is, this is really great. I'm talking about our human impact on climate um, and how that impacts our birds. Um, you know, folks are experiencing really extreme heat. And you mentioned earlier, lots of folks are running their energy right now. Um, there was a, a question um, a little bit about um, two kind of similar questions about collisions. Um, so Benita asked a question about when you speak of collision and Gary, this is a little bit referring to you um, in your presentation, are you referring to wind turbines only or actual poles and towers that transmit power as well um, when you are talking about collision? And then a follow-up question um, Don is asking about um, collision is if there are any policies being looked at concerning mitigating bird strikes, if it does um, relate to collisions maybe for wind farms. Yes, so on collisions, we're definitely talking about um, the towers and wires, um, the transmission infrastructure is what I was referring to um, directly. In the report, uh, we identify the species most at risk. It's your uh, ones primarily with poor eyesight and that are stronger, faster flyers. Um, but there's a whole chart in there, right? Uh, and so that's the good news, right? Is we know where they are, we know where they hunt, where they forage, where they nest, um, and we know what species are most vulnerable. So that really lets us sort of dial in the mitigation opportunities uh, on those particular uh, species. Um, and there are certainly ways to dramatically minimize those strikes by making the lines more visible. And then also in the design choices um, that developers use, right? Um, it's very, very simple things like a, a, a horizontal orientation of multiple lines, right? As, as opposed to a vertical uh, makes a tremendous difference, right? Uh, and, and so we try to, to express those things in the early in the design uh, process. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question kind of a little bit about um, kind of wind turbines was a question around kind of looking at the map that you showed ne didn't necessarily show like, the Gulf of Mexico um, or other expansions of like offshore wind and energy plans and that we have for sure along the Texas Gulf Coast. I was just curious if the study looked at the Gulf at all or maybe any other kind of offshore wind. So in the study, it didn't particularly dive into offshore wind. Many of our data sets were limited to terrestrial data sets, right? So we couldn't map um, beyond that. We have specifically looked at the Gulf offshore wind zone uh, and filed comments directly with BOEM on that. Um, so happy to provide that. Um, but just blanket speaking, um, we're finding that um, in national, international waters, outside, outside of the state waters, where these are located, uh, we're seeing minimal impacts. But uh, 
still early, still, still researching. Perfect. And then uh, one more question, I'm kind of getting almost to anybody, but uh, Nancy asked, what impact does increases in distributed, so like solar energy on homes, um, how might that ha decrease the need to build more um, off-grid? Yeah, that's all I'm happy to take that. Yeah, yeah go for go it, Doug. Go I was just going to say you said it best while I go anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I, as I would say um, solar is great. Solar with storage is better. Um, we are seeing more and more, and we're going to see later this week, there might be, I'm not predicting this, if it doesn't happen, don't, don't blame me for it. But I think later this week, we may see a conservation call again. And, we'll, and if we do, it's going to be in those evening hours. It's like seven to nine as the sun goes down. So each passing year, more and more value in storage, a little less in solar. doesn't mean there's not value in solar, particularly for you as a homeowner or renter or whatever, you're lowering the use inside your home. That has huge bill savings. It does help the grid. If you've got the right inverter and you've got storage, it helps reliability too, because if the grid goes down, you stay up. But that, that storage piece of it is gonna be more and more critical. And it doesn't have to be storage on the wall. It can be storage in your car, as long as you have the right inverter and all of that. Yep. Perfect. Uh, well, I'm uh, is, we are at the top of the hour, um, and there this was really good information. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, thank y'all for doing it. A little bit of humor it helps me to you know keep engaged with this. And I think right now with our extreme heat, you know this topic is really pertinent. Um, so, Lisa or any other panelists, do you have any other final thoughts? Are we good to wrap up? Thank you. I just, yeah, I just want to say thank you again, Beth, Doug, Gary, just really appreciate your participation in the conversation this afternoon. Really important topic for the state moving forward. And um, just want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's fall migration. So that means it's lights out Texas time. We'll do one <laughs> final plug. Uh, reach out to your local chapter, uh, get involved. Lots of great things happening. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, we'll all stay in touch. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye. -bye.